So first of all, thank you very much for the kind invitation to spend just a few minutes talking about materials, materials innovations, and how that might apply to nuclear energy. Uh, as the voice in the sky mentioned, I'm Jeremy Busby. I'm the Director of Material Science and Technology at Oak Ridge National Laboratory. Prior to that, I spent a lot of time working with a variety of Department of Energy programs on both water reactors and advanced reactors. I've only got 10 to 12 minutes, and materials innovation is a very broad topic, and I can only scratch the surface. So rather than going into any one area very deeply, I'd rather spend a few minutes talking about modern material science, the techniques that we have today that we didn't have 5, 10, 50 years ago, and how those might apply to nuclear energy, both of today and tomorrow. And so I want to talk through modern material science and give just a few examples. While I'm going to talk specifically about water reactors, both operation today and life extension or subsequent life extension, keep in mind that all of these also apply to fusion reactors or advanced reactors or Gen 4 type reactors. So with no further ado, let's get into it. Before we can talk about where we're going in material science, we have to understand where we are today. <clears throat> and today, nuclear power, our plants operate relying on performance of traditional materials. And to capture just how traditional they are, I borrowed a plot from Zinkel, Tarani, and Sneed from last year, a, a journal article. And what you can see on the right is a bar graph showing all of the alloys in common use as a function of the years in service, and that's captured by the purple bars. I don't know if you can read the scale, but many of the alloys we use have been in service since 1960s. The diamonds that are plotted also demonstrate the year the alloy was originally patented. 304 stainless steel, our good old friend in both our water reactor fleet and many advanced designs, is rapidly approaching its 100th anniversary. Now, there's good reasons for using these traditional materials. We know how they work. We know how to make them, weld them, fabricate them. We know how they perform in an environment, but that comes as a trade. Alloys developed in recent years have much higher performance, but we don't know as much about them. And so you have to balance that. And when we're talking about nuclear energy, the bar for material performance is very high. We're talking about an extreme environment, high temperature, corrosive environment, radiation damage, or a combination of all of those for 40, for 60, for 80 years of lifetime. It has to be reliable, or at least not fail suddenly. Give us enough time to identify a problem, to repair, to replace it. It has to be affordable. You have to be able to make it. There's a lot of particular demands that go into advanced materials. And further, if we want to replace materials or uh, adopt them or, or modify them, a purely Edisonian or experimental discovery approach just won't work. By Edisonian, I mean referring all the way back to Thomas Edison's search for the light bulb filament. He spent years examining 3,000 different materials, one after another, until he found one that worked, eventually settling on burned sewing thread. If I told a regulator or industry today that I could develop a new material that would last 80 years, just give me 3,000 opportunities to try them one after another. It's a very short discussion. But the upshot is we don't have to do that. We don't have to reply on the trial and error approach. We've got all these modern material science techniques that are available to allow us to provide materials performance, improved safety, reliability, and economics. What do I mean by modern material science? There's lots of developments. Material science as a discipline is evolving every day. Five years ago, we didn't have our understanding of theory of radiation damage, corrosion, or alloy development that we do today. And that's bolstered by growths and modeling and simulation, new tools, new techniques. We also have the ability to develop and synthesize new alloys, ceramics, multilayers, thin films, nanostructures, etc much quicker, much faster, much more efficiently. But perhaps most interesting to myself, my personal interest, structural characterization. The ability to interrogate and understand materials using electrons, ion beams, protons, photons, neutrons. 
the capability to examine these materials in extreme environments, sometimes in situ. And then applying materials physics and chemistry techniques to further explore performance. And I'll show in the lower right, I borrowed a picture from Peter Hostman, California, Berkeley. A mechanical test of a specimen, microns in size. Nanoscale testing. So how do we apply these tools? Well, alloy development's the obvious choice, right? There are lots of industries out there looking at new materials, often ahead of the nuclear industry. Let me give a quick example, what's shown on the right is an image I borrowed from an alloy development program for engines. In this case, the goal was to explore higher efficiency materials to meet the CAFE standards for automotive. In this case, they used supercomputers, in fact, the world's third fastest supercomputer to explore microstructures in this aluminum magnesium alloy. Every yellow dot you see is an aluminum atom, every blue is a magnesium atom, and what they found was that by controlling the composition and processing treatment very specifically, they could generate microstructures and properties that were only theoretical. Then they went out and melted the alloy, and sure enough, they've now created an alloy that's better performing engine parts such as a cylinder head and have met the 2050 CAFE standards in only 18 months of work. Who cares? The novel thing about this is they used the supercomputing and computational part first. It wasn't go melt something and then see if I can understand the theory. They put the computer part first. Much more rapid turnaround. And I could literally talk about alloy development examples for an hour. I won't do that. I think there are other areas that we can talk about where material science and modern material science can have a larger impact on nuclear energy. And so I'm going to do that. Uh, the next three slides I'll cover, can we predict material performance? Allow us to go beyond the simple extrapolation of data. Can we talk about advanced manufacturing? Can we talk about non-destructive evaluation tools? Indeed, I think modern materials characterization, our ability to predict performance, may lead to new understanding in operational settings. For instance, combining and coupling of new sensors and robotics, like EPRI's concrete crawler that's shown in the center. Coupling that with materials understanding, modeling and simulation will allow us new tools to assess condition and performance throughout lifetime. The ability to passively measure component integrity helps increase reliability and safety. And the identification of precursor states in a material or in a component may allow us to repair, replace, or mitigate damage before failure. As an example of where this is going, on the right side, I've borrowed some plots from Dwight Clayton, who's working on the DOE Light Water Reactor Sustainability Program and a new type of concrete non-destructive evaluation. In the upper left image, you see a test block that was created. The little pink piece of styrofoam was embedded in rebar and concrete to simulate a flaw you might find in a power plant. They used traditional ultrasonic techniques that you find on roads and highways, but what was novel is they applied modern mathematics and computational tools to the signals, very similar to what you see in a hospital with uh, ultrasound on the body and internal organs. In this case, they go from not being able to see a defect in traditional techniques so in the bottom, the MBIR, that yellow spot is the exact flaw, the yellow dots in the upper part of the rebar. We can now see reliably, with great fidelity, where components or flaws are. Now imagine being able to couple that with an understanding of the degradation that might come along with it. Which brings me to my next point. Today we can predict material performance in service that goes well beyond extrapolation of some observations in service or a little bit of data from a laboratory. Right, the modeling and simulation tools would conduct it or would coupled with validated measurements and characterization provide new insights into performance. Let me give another couple of examples. The far right, you see a, a series of colored layers. It's actually a finite element mesh developed by Alain Giorla and Jan Lepop at Oak Ridge, where they're looking at the integrity of the concrete structure. In this case, the image is for a BWR RPV pedestal. And by 
creating this mesh, they can now do mechanical simulations of performance under different degradation scenarios, alkali silica reactions, radiation damage, or others. Very powerful technique, especially when coupled with non-destructive evaluation. Shown in the center, the Grizzly Assessment Tool, developed by Ben Spencer and his team at Idaho National Laboratory. The same thing for the reactor pressure vessel. What's shown is a quarter section of the vessel in two different conditions. The one on the right with the blue and the colored takes well-established relations for radiation embrittlement, simulates them over space and time. And now we can see which areas are the most susceptible to embrittlement. The image on the left, now you take that mechanical understanding, that material understanding, and you can simulate performance under accident conditions. In this case, pressurized thermal shock. What's shown is hoop stress under pressurized thermal shock. And in this case, now you can identify what areas are most susceptible and use it to target my evaluations, my surveillance. So by coupling these tools, we can make operations safer, more efficient, more reliable. The last area I'll talk about is advanced manufacturing. Manufacturing and fabrication have come a long way in the last few years, especially when we talk about additive manufacturing, 3D printing. We can now print metal components for things like rocket engines, which is shown in the upper right. That's an actual part printed out of titanium for rocket dyeing. Not only that, we now have the capability to control texture or composition during a build or a print. The little A shape in the upper center with all the different colors is actually one component that was printed very carefully and by controlling the powders or controlling the energy deposition, they can control the orientation of the grains. And if you see the outer edge of that red rim, all the grains point outward to reduce wear and fretting. Perhaps most exciting is we now have the capability to allow for measurements of quality during fabrication. The little movie that's playing is actually an infrared scan in situ examination during fabrication. And I'm gonna walk right up to the screen. In the center box in the middle right, flaws. We now know where the flaws are as the part is constructed. No more guessing, no more measuring, no more hoping. Can you take this into nuclear? Probably. What just popped up on the far right is a demo piece for an actual production 3D print of a control plate for the high flux isotope reactor at Oak Ridge National Laboratory. Not full scale, but a demo that the technology is there. So with that, let me stop and finish and state that modern material science can further nuclear energy. We've got decades of reliable emission-free electricity, but through proactive management, cautious deployment of improvements, we have the opportunity now to take modern material science ideas and use the new technologies to further improve safety, reliability, and economics. So with that, I will end. Thank you very much.